So in yesterday's lesson, what we went through was seeing how if I just gave you something that looked like, say, square root of x to the 12th, how would you go about simplifying that? And so we saw that we would turn that into a fractional exponent. So in this case, that would become x to the 12 over 2. And then we would go ahead and reduce that fraction. And in this case, it actually reduces down to a really nice, pretty whole number. It becomes x to the 6. And so that's the part that we did yesterday. The part that's new today is that you have both x and y under the radical. Well, we approach it the same way. It's just that basically now it's like we have two problems embedded in one. Because I'm just going to do the same thing, just I'm going to do it to each of them individually. And so then that becomes y to the 6 halves, which just equals y cubed. Okay, that's not so bad. So we're going to be doing the same thing. It's just a matter of doing it to everything. Now, in the case of the second one, though, that means that I'm going to be doing the cube root of 64, the cube root of a number along the way, as well as the cube root of x to the 15th, and the cube root of y cubed. So what is the cube root, then, of 64? In other words, what number times itself three times equals 64? This is actually on that list of notes that I gave you of terms you want to memorize because it comes up often enough. Yes, it is 4. So that just gives us 4. And then I have to deal with the x's. Now I'm going to go ahead and write out all the work for the x's just because I want to make it extra clear where my answers are coming from. So x to the 15 thirds and y to the 3 thirds. All right, now the 4, there's nothing else I can do with it. The 4 is just a 4 because it's a number, not an exponent, so it just stays 4. Then the x is 15 over 3 equals 5, so that becomes x to the 5th. The y terms, 3 over 3 equals 1. Well, I don't really have to write 1, y to the 1 there, because y to the 1 equals y, so that's how I then get my answer there. 4x to the 5th times y. As we work through these two problems, you're going to see some new variations, some added complexities here that we have to deal with that we didn't have to deal with on the previous two. So like in this first one, the very first thing I'm doing is I have to deal with what's the square root of 50. Well, is that a nice pretty whole number, the square root of 50? No. So I have to go back to remember how do I then simplify square root of 50? Well, remember this is where we have to look for the biggest perfect square that goes into it and break it up into two pieces. What is the biggest perfect square that multiplies into 50? 25. Because it has to multiply in evenly and be a perfect square. 25 goes in twice. So for the root 50, that is going to become root 25 times root 2. That's just the square root of 50 is root 25 times root 2. And I'll continue simplifying that here. Well, I was going to say on the next line, but let's go ahead and actually just work that through and see where that takes us, and then we'll go into our variables. All right, so the root 25, root 2, remember the reason why I look for the biggest perfect square is because I can actually take the square root of it now. The square root of 25 is 5. So that becomes 5 root 2. Notice root 2 is staying at root 2 because I can't simplify it anymore. All right. Now that's as much as the root 50 can go. So now I'm going to go ahead and delve into my variables. So the square root of x squared, that is the same as x to the power of 2 over 2. The square root of y to the 6 is y to the 6 over 2. And the square root of z to the 9th is z to the 9 over 2. And so we can go ahead and simplify each of those. So x to the 2 over 2, that's x to the power of 1. But of course, we don't need to write the 1 in there because x is just x to the 1 y to the 6 over 2. Well, 6 over 2 equals 3. Okay, z, z to the 9 halves. Okay, this one doesn't go in evenly, right? So this one doesn't give us a whole number. So a refresher, how do we deal with it when it's not a nice pretty whole number? Well, I turn it into a mixed number, so that becomes z to the 4 and a half, because 2 goes into 9 4 times with 1 left over. And so, that means that that's actually going to become, got to write the rest in because nothing else is changing, I'm just cleaning up the z, 
That means that z to the 4 and a half becomes z to the 4 times z to the 1 half. And z to the 1 half power, remember, is the square root of z. Now, this answer, while technically correct, is not as clean as I would like it to be. Because notice I got a couple square roots floating around separately from each other. Just like we can pull all of those square roots apart and treat them separately up here, I can put them back together again down here to write a simpler answer. So, to write a final, all together, final answer, all nice and pretty, I'm going to put the roots at the end. So I'm grabbing everything that isn't a root. So 5x, y cubed, z to the fourth. So that's everything that was not inside of a root, that is not inside of a radical. Root, radical, synonyms. Okay, but then inside the root, inside the square root in this case, I have a 2 and I have a z. So it's 2z inside of it. Because those roots are multiplied, so the stuff inside gets multiplied when inside the root. That's your final answer. That's what we're looking for. All right, now on to the second one. So in the second one, we approach it the same basic way. I'm going to go ahead and simplify the cube root of the 16, and then I'm going to simplify the cube root of each of the variables with their exponents. It's just that the cube root of 16 is, well, it's the same idea as the way we deal with square roots, but not entirely the same. Because when we simplify the square root of 50, remember I said, what was the biggest perfect square that goes into 50? If I'm going to simplify the cube root of 16, that means I need to break it up into two pieces where I'm looking for the biggest perfect cube that goes into 16. Well, 16 is a nice small number. There's not a whole lot of numbers to go into it. In fact, there's only one perfect cube, rather than one, that goes into 16. And that is, yes, 8. 8 is a perfect cube because I know that 2 cubed equals 8. And so I split it up into the cube root of 8 and the cube root of 2 because 8 times 2 is the 16. So that's what my first line up here is going to look like. is cube root of 8 and cube root of 2. And remember with the square root, I looked for the biggest perfect square because I knew, that, okay, now the square root of 25, I can get a whole number out of that. It's the same idea here, why we look for biggest perfect cube. What is the cube root of 8? 2. 2. It's a whole number. That's why I looked for the 8, because I could turn it into a whole number then. And then the cube root of 2, it's still there. It's still hanging out. Because there's no way I can simplify the cube root of 2. It's as good as it gets. And then from there, we repeat the same kind of process that we've been doing with our variables with the cube roots of x to the 12th, y squared, and z to the 8th. So I'm going to turn each of those into a fractional exponent. So it becomes x to the 12 thirds, y to the 2 thirds, and z to the 8 thirds. All right, so now we simplify those fractions any ways we can. So the x to the 12 thirds, well, 12 thirds just equals 4. So that's x to the 4th. Uh, y to the 2 thirds. Well, 2 thirds doesn't reduce at all. And I can't turn it into a mixed number, so it's actually just going to stay exactly the same. It's going to stay y to the 2 thirds. And the z? Well, the z, I can turn that one into a mixed number, even though it doesn't reduce. So I can turn it into a mixed number. 3 goes into 8 two times with 2 left over. So that's why it's 2 and 2 thirds. Okay, so that part i got to clean up before I can do anything else then. So, okay, let's do a little clean up. So that gives me 2, cube root 2, x to the fourth, y to the 2 thirds. Okay, now that becomes z squared and z to the 2 thirds. All right, I still have those fractional exponents sitting in my work here. Uh, I can't leave them as fractional exponents in my final answer, so I'm now going to turn those each into a radical. So cube root of 2, x to the 4th. All right, 
y to the 2 thirds. That becomes q root of y squared, which is actually just where it started from, because that's the one that didn't simplify. Okay, then that's times z squared. Make sure you don't accidentally write that z under the radical from the y that we just wrote in there. We need to make sure that's clearly outside of it. Because this z to the 2 thirds, that's the part that is inside the radical. We got cube root of z squared. A little side note here, if you wanted to jump straight from this line down to that line and skip this line here, that would be okay. Because you're probably getting a nice feel for how we get there. Or, similarly, you could also have skipped this line and gone straight from first to third lines. That would also work. The basic idea here is that we just need to put in enough work so it's clear where everything came from, and that's part of it. All right. Last step, because yes, we aren't actually done yet, because I have a bunch of cube roots floating around together here, as I want to make those all into a single radical. I want to combine them all under the same roof, so to speak. So everything that's not under a radical, I write first. So that's 2, x to the fourth, z squared. That's everything that was not inside of the radical. Now I actually need to put in the radical. All of them are cube root which means I can put them all together. If one of them somehow, some way ended up a cube root and another one was like a sixth root, I couldn't put them all under the same radical, at least not without manipulating them. All right, so since they all are cube roots, I put everything that's inside of a cube root all underneath the same roof, so that's two y squared, z squared. Now that is our final answer. Now I showed lots of steps, which when you first look at it, probably makes it look more complicated. But notice each step along the way here, hopefully at least, fairly doable. All right, so now that we have done all those problems, we can now look at how do we deal with something that looks like this. We now have a fraction. In fact, fractions involving radicals are going to become one of our main themes here in the next day or two. But this one, it's almost the easy version in its own way. There's two different ways you can do this problem, and I want to show you both ways. Okay, so first up, let's go ahead and start by just simplifying the radical on the top and the radical on the bottom. So, let's go ahead and do that. The root 72, does the square root of 72 equal a whole number? No. That means I need to look for the biggest perfect square that goes into it. What is the biggest perfect square that goes into 72? Here we go, somebody got, it is 36. Because 36 times 2 equals 72. Yes, there are other perfect squares that go in, but that's the biggest. Then, we have the x to the 13 halves, and the y to the 6 halves. We give the same treatment to the bottom. And so the square root of 4, is that a nice pretty whole number? Pretty. Yeah. Okay, square root of 4, because that just equals 2. So we do that. Let's just take square root. Square root of 4 is 2. Okay, and then the x. x to the 6 becomes x to the 6 over 2, because it's inside the square root. And now we're just going to tidy up whatever we can along the way there. So on the top, the square root of 36, I wanted the perfect square because I can take the square root of it. Square root of 36 is 6. So that's now 6 root 2. That takes care of the root 72 part. Now, the x to the 13 halves, 2 goes into 13 6 times, so that tells me I have an x to the 6, with 1 left over, so that means it's 6 and a half, which isn't written super clearly there, so I'm going to rewrite that, x to the 6 and a half. All right, then the y's, y to the 6 halves, that just equals y cubed, because 6 over 2 equals 3. On the bottom, the 2 is still just a 2, because, of course, now there's just a number, there's nothing to do to it. And x to the 6 halves becomes x cubed. All right, a little bit more tidying we can do on top. I'm going to go ahead and make that 6 root 2, x to the 6 root x, y cubed, over 2x cubed.
All right, and then, well, you know, in the last problems, we went ahead and tidied. Okay, well, let's go ahead and tidy up the top, even though we could actually do a different step next. But let's go ahead and tidy up the top. <coughs> See where that gives us. All right, so then that's 6. X to the 6, Y cubed. Remember, I'm grabbing each of those that's outside of the radical and grouping those first. That way I can then grab everything that's inside of the square root and put them next. So then square root, stuff inside is 2 and x. And that's over 2x cubed. But we're not done at this point because the fraction, and notice we can still reduce this fraction. When I go to reduce the fraction, whole numbers reduce with whole numbers the same way they always would. So I'm reducing the fraction 6 over 2. What does 6 over 2 equal? 3. three. Okay, so that just becomes a 3. I've dealt with the 6 and the 2 now. All right, the x's now. I have x to the 6th over x cubed here. What does that become? Yep, that becomes x cubed, x to the 3rd. Because remember, if I divide, I subtract the exponents. So 3x cubed... Well, I now used everything that was on the bottom of this, so there's definitely nothing else that's going to cancel, so it stays a y cubed, and it stays a square root of 2x. That is it. That is our final answer. Okay. Now, I did say there's two methods for doing this. This is one of the methods. Make sure you have this written down, the work written down as well, because it's about to go away so that I can show you the other method. All right. Now take a look at the other way. The other way that we could approach this problem takes advantage of the fact that we have a square root over everything on the top and a square root over everything on the bottom. They're both the same radical. So the other way you could actually do this is first turn into the square root, one big square root of everything exactly as it was. And so that's what your first step would look like using this technique. And there are certain problems where the first technique is more useful, specifically when you see lots of perfect squares. And there's other problems where this technique might be more useful, like if I don't see a whole lot of perfect squares, but it lets me actually proceed by doing a lot of canceling. Because you notice that by writing it this way, I now can actually start by reducing my fraction, rather than waiting until the end to reduce the fraction. So I have 72 over 4. Okay, let's reduce it. What does 72 over 4 equal? 18. And I can just find that in the calculator, see if I can divide both by 4. I can, so that gives me the 18. And then the x to the 13th over x to the 6th. Again, remember when we divide, we subtract the exponents. So 13 minus 6 is 7. So that gives me x to the 7th. And there's nothing on the bottom to cancel the y out with, so that stays a y to the 6. Notice everything on the bottom canceled out in this case. And so now, I'm simplifying that. Which kind of looks like the last set of problems that we had done before this one. And so, we still have to proceed, though, and simplify that. So go ahead and try simplifying it from there on your own, because you've now actually practiced these types before. And then we'll finish it out together. And so there's what we should get as our final answer. Same thing, two different methods. It's a good thing it comes out the same way, otherwise we'd have a problem.
And really, it's a matter of just looking at the original problem and picking a method that you think will be right. And, you know, if you don't pick right, it's still doable. But sometimes one method might seem easier than another.